That's loud. Thanks for coming, by the way. We're going to start in like a second, as soon as I guess you're all on the Zoom. If you see the Zoom link on like the first um, slide of the slides, if you're on the slides, which are posted there. Okay, cool. Normally, theoretically, we'd have a projector. We do not this time, but possibly in the future, so stay tuned for that. Is that everyone? I think so. Cool. Yay. Thank you so much for being here. Welcome to um, ACM ICPC Beginner Track Plus Plus Week Two. Um, intro to graph theory would be really fun. Um, just before we start, I guess, does anyone feel like they like know stuff about graph theory already? Like vertices, um, edges, and I don't know. Is anyone, is anyone like familiar with that those, a little bit? Yeah, okay, cool. Cool, cool. I just want to know before we get started. Great, that's great to know. All right, um, so. This is what we're going to be going through today. Um, we're going to do like a um, real world problem kind of involving uh, graphs. And then we're going to have, we're going to talk about formally, like what is a graph, how to implement them. And we're going to do some problems with them along with uh, learning exactly. graph traversal and algorithms and how, what, how you can augment those algorithms to actually solve problems. Yep. So it's kind of a lot, but it'll be really, really fun because graphs are fun. I promise you. Okay, cool. Um, let's get to our first problem, which is six degrees to Bieber. This is just a real world ish example. Hopefully, I'll know that's in Bieber. Okay. So, the six handshakes rule, which is also known as the six degrees of separation theory, claims that we can get to know anybody by connecting through six people or fewer. So, for example, like, um, let's say you want to know, like, Billy Eilish or something, and you're like, Oh, like my mom's contractor's brother's son is like her water guy, then that's like five people. You know what I mean? Five connections. Okay, so you hearing this, hearing this fact about the six handshakes rule or whatever, um, being a massive believer, you want to know how many people you would need to go through to connect to Justin Bieber. And so you want to ask for this group of people, is the six handshakes rule true? Cool. So let's imagine that you got like a list of all the people that you know and all the people that Justin Bieber knows. So you have this list. Um, and you can say you trace all these connections. So Justin Bieber's friends with these people, Alvin and Bill and Lenny, and then Alvin's friends with all these people, and of course, Justin Bieber. Um, Far is friends with just, with just Alvin. And then all the way down this list to where you are friends with Rohit and Rishi. So this list is like cool. Um, and it's good information to have, and it's crazy kind of, yeah, you got it. But it's also difficult to like see the connections in it. It's difficult to see immediately, like, you know, how close you are to Justin Bieber uh, through people. You can see maybe that um, Farah is one away from Justin because she can go through Elvin, or two away from Justin because she can go through Elvin. But anybody else is kind of going to be difficult. So we want a way to see this that's more like, Visual, so we can actually see something. And I mean, I guess we want to see it. How about we just draw it out? Okay, cool. So um, we have Justin Bieber right here. And so we know, let me just close this really quick. Okay, cool. So we know that um, Bieber is friends with Alvin, Bill, and Lenny. So we can connect those dots. And we also know that Alvin is friends with Bill, Emma, Giovanni, Farah. We can connect those dots and so on and so forth right, um, all the way up to you. So now we have this structure that makes it a lot easier to see how close any two people are, or closeness is like um, how many people we have to go through to be able to contact them, right? And it's pretty easy to read because we can see that the dots represent people and the lines represent like friendship or some sort of relationship. So for Emma, for example, we can see that she can get to Justin Bieber the quickest through to be, to, be more specific to the least amount of people 
um, through Alvin. So she just needs to say, hey, Alvin, can you introduce me to Justin Bieber? And then he would theoretically do that. But we also should note that there are other ways for her to get to Justin Bieber um, that just take longer. So for example, she could call um, Alvin and Alvin can say, I'm not gonna introduce you to anybody, but I will come, well, I will not introduce you to Justin Bieber, but I will introduce you to my friend, Bill, and maybe he'll be nicer than me. And so she could call Emma, um, Alvin, who calls Bill, who calls Justin Bieber, right? So that will be three calls total. Cool, but still, when you're looking at you, Hello. We're just getting started. Thanks for coming. The slides link is right on the board. And there's a zoom on the first page. Okay, cool. Um, awesome. So when you're looking at yourself all the way over here, it's hard to immediately see the least amount of people that you need to know to be able to contact Justin Bieber still. But we can see that to find that we'd need to find the length of like the shortest path um, from you to Justin Bieber, where we can define like the length of the path by how many people one would need to go through to contact him, right? Does that make sense? Okay, cool, cool, cool. Please interrupt me though if you have any questions ever. Cool. Um, so great. We successfully turned our original problem into a new weirder problem. Um, of finding this shortest path. How would we do that? Um, one way that we could do that, I guess a pretty intuitive way would be we just try every single path, but we can see how they very quickly take a very long time. And you're a huge fan, but you have schoolwork to do, so you've got to be efficient. So the question we want to ask is, is there a faster way to find the shortest path than just brute force checking every single path that's possible? Um, well, one general problem solving technique is to start with the easy cases, right? And so we can ask, what is the shortest path to Justin Bieber for, say, Alvin? So it's pretty clear, um, we've already said it, uh, that it's one, right? Alvin is, is, is connected to Justin Bieber. And um, so um, it's friends with him. So how can we use this fact that the shortest path um, to Justin Bieber for Alvin is one, to find the shortest path to Justin Bieber for any friends of Alvin's. I'll give you a second or two to ponder it, I guess. Cool. It's been like a minute. That's cool. Um, so awesome. Does anyone have any observations they made or things they thought about that they want to talk about? Literally anything about like how you could find the shortest path to just meet with you like far or something for far or something um, by knowing that Alvin's shortest path is one. Okay, cool. Uh, no worries. Um, so instead, can anyone tell me, of course, the shortest path from Bill to Justin Bieber? Yeah, yeah, perfect. Uh, one. So the crucial observation is that while we don't know, thank you, by the way, uh, the shortest path from you to Justin Bieber for these three people, um, for Alvin, Bill, and Lenny, let me turn this on, actually, one second. It's always fun with a laser pointer. From, uh, for Alvin, Bill, and Lenny, 
uh, we are sure that the shortest path to Justin Bieber is one. And we know that because, well, there's no possible shorter path. So if it's one, that's as short as you're going to get. Um, and so here I'm going to color them light blue so that we know um, that the shortest path is one. OK, awesome. So now we can um, look at everyone that Alvin's connected to and make a similar observation. So because Emma's connected to Alvin, we know the shortest path from Emma to Alvin is one, because there are no shorter paths. But um, Alvin's light blue, so we already know that the shortest path from Alvin to Justin Bieber is one. So we know that the shortest path then from Emma to Justin Bieber will be one plus one, which is two. Um, so we can just color them in right there. So that for all friends of Alvin, the shortest path will be um, two. Except we should know another important observation that Bill is also a friend of Alvin's, except um, Bill's shortest path to Justin Bieber is still um, one, right? So should we color Bill in blue or no? No, perfect, yeah, because we still, we know already that it's one. The general rule is um, that we can follow is that if someone already is colored in, uh, then we don't need to color them in again. Okay, cool. So we can just, does this make sense by the way? Yeah, yeah, okay, cool. We can just um, continue this way until we get the shortest path for everyone. Fantastic. Uh, and now you can see much easier that unfortunately, um, is seven degrees of separation between you and Justin Bieber. So the six degree rule doesn't hold and you'll have to do a lot more work. Well, one more person worth of work to get to him um, in this group of people. Uh, yeah, hopefully that was um, all right to follow. If it wasn't, if it was like difficult to follow, don't worry, because we're going to go over it kind of again, more formally. But as it turns out, this whole like thing, this picture structure is a more general paradigm of problem solving, which you probably already guessed, that's called a graph. And so what we want to do with this problem is just show how naturally graphs can arise in a ton of different situations and how you can go about problem solving with them. Even before we go over like all the definitions and algorithms, which we are absolutely going to do in a moment. Um, and also what we actually derived here together um, was using something called breadth per search to find the shortest path between different things. Well, but I'm gonna, we're gonna talk about that in a moment. So um, now that the graphs have hopefully intrigued you with their power and awesomeness, um, we're gonna go into formalizing what they actually are. So fantastic. What is a graph? And I can put back to you. Thank you so much. Um, so in graph theory, a graph is just a set of vertices and edges representing relationships between objects. So you can see vertices is just plural for vertex. Um, we have two vertices and an edge between them. Okay. And so you call something, you'll call two vertices adjacent if they're connected by an edge. So we can see that these two vertices here are adjacent. And um, you'll also refer to the degree is how many edges that a vertex has. So these vertices all up here have degree of one. And this one is connected to all three of them. So it has a degree. Three. All righty. Um, and so formally, like the like more like mathematical definition or whatever, is if we let G be the graph and B be the set of vertices on G um, and E be the set of edges on G, then we can denote the graph like this. Uh, we have an E. So for example, with this graph right here, we have uh, the vertices one, two, three, and four, and the edges, edges between one, two, one, three, two, three, and two, four. Um, so you can define, you can see how you can define edges by the vertices that they connect. And in competitive programming, you will generally be given a graph in terms of edges, or at least in the problems that we're going to be doing today. So you'll be given a graph um, with input data that will look something like this. Um, not always. And there could be like, they could also look like grids or in trickier problems, you have to construct the graph yourself from other data. I think we're going to be doing one kind of like that today too. But um, but, but like, especially for the problems that we're going to have on most of the problems that we're going to have on the contest will look kind of like this. Okay, cool. Um, so for example, some other some examples of graphs, you can have a friendship graph, which we also saw in our earlier example, which were like vertices represent people 
and edges represent like friendship. So we can see this person is well-connected. They have lots of friends and this person is alone. Um, we also have like a neighborhood graph maybe um, where vertices represent landmarks and edges represent the roads between them. All right. And so we also talked about a path. Now, formally, a path um, from some vertex A to some other vertex B is a collection of vertices um, A, then vertex C1, C2, CN, CB, um, such that all of those um, A, C1, C1, C2, et cetera, are edges. So really, it's exactly what you'd think it would be, probably. And similarly, we have um, a cycle. Let me see. Oh, this is animated. That's nice. OK, great. We also have a cycle, um, which you can also call a circuit, uh, which is a special case of a path where A is equal to B. So it just starts and ends at the same vertex, and it comes back around, which is probably what you would think that a cycle is. Yay. We also have something cool called directed graphs, which um, are a set of vertices and edges. The edges have an error on them indicating a direction. So you know, sadly, because you might have relationships that are one-sided, like you're like, I consider this person a friend, but they don't necessarily consider you a friend, and that's devastating, and that's where we have directed graphs. Um, so you can see that this arrow right here is um, representing direction. Okay, cool. And also for directed graphs, we have um, to have like a different definition for degree, because we now have two different ways that, gra that nodes can be, uh, vertices rather, can be connected. Um, one could be pointing to another one or one could be getting pointed to. And so we consider that like the in degree would be how many edges are pointing to a given vertex and the out degree would be how many edges are pointing away from a given vertex. And so we can see um, four, for example, has an in degree of one, but an out degree of two. So it's pointing to two, getting pointed to by one. Just a nice terminology to know um, I don't know if it'll be too relevant today, but yeah, I guess you should know that. Um, awesome. So now that we've formalized what graphs are, oh, do you have any questions, by the way? Sorry, about any of that. Cool, cool. Just checking. Cool. So um, next, we're going to learn about implementation. So how to actually like code with these, because the fixtures are nice, but like, what's that going to do? Okay. Um, so there are a few ways to actually store a graph. The two most common ones would be an adjacency list and an adjacency matrix. Um, so they kind of look like this, and we're going to see what they actually are. Um, once my computer unfreezes. Yeah. Sorry, give me one second while my computer loads. Oh, great. OK, so the idea here with an adjacency list is that we have you know, Actually, right, this is important too. Do you, I know some of you are in CS32 do, um, and some in CS31. Do you know what vectors are? Plus plus. Okay, cool. A vector is basically an array um, that's like dynamically sized and it has some other like things, like it has like functions that are built into it that you could do uh, stuff um, with it. But we can go over syntax too. Um, if you have questions, but that's great to know. So the idea here is that we have a vector where each entry refers to a vertex in the graph. So for each vertex, we're going to store a vector of all its adjacent vertices. So it's basically a vector of vectors, right? Um, so for example, zero, actually we'll see this in a second. We can put um, a graph into an adjacency list this way. So we have zero being connected to one and two, right? So we see zero is connected to one and two. So it's adjacent to one and two, and we put that in its adjacency list. One is adjacent to zero, two, and three. So we have zero, two, and three in its adjacency list. Hopefully that makes sense. Um, cool. Does that make sense? Do you want to do this example? Yeah, OK, great. So um, I'll give you a second to, I guess, look over it, and then we can talk about it together. Yeah. 
Um, sorry. Yay. Are you ready to go over it together? Or do you want more, a few more seconds, minutes? You ready? Cool, cool. Yay. So um, for, I guess, well, this isn't even animated. So I'll just show the answer on the screen. Cool. Hopefully this, we've got something like this. You can see that zero is adjacent to three. And so we have it and it's adjacency list. Yes. I haven't seen multiple edges between, I think they specify usually that that isn't the case or I don't think it would arise often naturally in my experience, but, and I'll, Incident on a node, a vertex itself twice, and parallel edge being two edges that are incident on the same vertex. So basically, if this graph had another edge that went from zero to three, that's a parallel edge. But yeah, most of the time, compared to our That's a fantastic question. Um, yes, thank you. Awesome. So um, this is how you put a graph into an adjacency list. Hooray. And so um, you can see also for how this looks a bit different for directed graphs. Because um, in directed graphs, you only want to put an edge in the list and something the adjacency list if that edge is outgoing. Welcome, by the way. We have um, the link to the slides right on the board right there. Okay, thank you. Um, awesome. So does this make sense? All that stuff. I just want to keep asking, because in previous quarters, we've done this workshop and went way too fast. So I'm going to go slower. Okay, great. Um, so an adjacency list in code, um, this is using vectors. Uh, you could declare like a vector of integers an adjacency list uh, called add list. And then you can um, push into zero, you can push one, you can, for one, you can push zero in because for a um, undirected graph, you've got to do both ways, of course, because they're both adjacent to each other. Um, but in a directed graph, you don't have to do both ways. So it's technically kind of less work, which is great. Um, and so here, this code is just checking if zero is adjacent to two. And so you see that for this, we have to go through I'm animating what the code does. We have to go through the whole adjacency list to check adjacency. Um, and that's cool, but it is like winter time. And what if we want to check if um, something was adjacent and we want to do it instantly? There is something we could do about that. Um, we can use an adjacency matrix. So the idea here is that we create a matrix um, a vector of vectors and a array of arrays, uh, where an entry is one if there is an edge between the two vertices and it's zero otherwise. Okay, so for example, we could put a graph into an adjacency matrix this way. And we also can see that this matrix is symmetric, so that is across this diagonal here, it looks like a reflection of itself. And this is because this graph here is undirected. So if a vertex is um, adjacent to another vertex, that implies that. Vertex A is adjacent to vertex B, it implies that vertex B is adjacent to vertex A. And this is not necessarily true though for directed graphs. In fact, it's like almost never true. Okay. Thank you. Um, so does this make sense or would you like to try this example for yourself just to be sure that you understand how adjacency matrices work? Okay, awesome, yay. Uh, so this is what this one would look like um, placed in here. Great, um, come back to this if you wanna test yourself after. Uh, and for directed graphs though, it gets a little bit more complicated because we know if you need to put a one if there's a connection between them, but we know now that there are two different types of connections. Um, 
in degree, out degree, you know. So the convention for this is that uh, the row will be the one that's pointing to the column. So for example, um, here, because we have two pointing to zero, uh, then there would be a one in position two, zero. Because two is pointing to zero. Fantastic. And so um, here is just some example code for this. Where we're declaring an adjacency matrix. Um, and then we're putting in these different values. And that, thank you. Um, we're just checking if zero is adjacent to one. And that is so much quicker now because we're using an adjacency matrix. Uh, so we can just do it instantly, check. So that is great. Um, but there is one major uh, con to the adjacency matrix was the fact that it uses a lot of unnecessary space because um, you're just porting a whole bunch of zeros. Um, so you got to watch out for that if you're looking for like space efficiency. So basically, the adjacency matrix is best used for graphs with a lot of edges. Um, and the adjacency list is best used for graphs with a few edges. And we can even see this in the examples that we went over because we could see that um, the adjacency list, when we did the same graph, right? The adjacency list is storing eight measures right here. And this one is storing 16, which is like double, which isn't great. Um, but here we need to check up to three different numbers to determine adjacency um, in this last row. Whereas with the adjacency matrix, you always just need to check one. So it's really a trade-off um, and you need to determine which one you want to use for um, a given problem. And with that, we're going to jump into our first problem, um, weak vertices. And it's really just to give you practice implementing graphs because it can kind of be a lot. Graphs are kind of implementation heavy and not everything that we go over. Like last week, it wasn't very implementation heavy um, and a lot, not everything we go over in, in uh, beginner track plus class is going to be. But since this is, you want to really like give you time to practice that. So I'm going to give you a second to read it. You can at least open that link and tell me if it doesn't work. It should work. And, um, or you can read it on the next slide, which I'll leave up on the screen. Just give me a thumbs up when you read it. Oh, that's another test case. Um, so that's, I'm pretty sure maybe I should pull it up actually, but I'm pretty sure that's just another test case. Like the one is representing. Oh, I see. Yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. and that's excuse me seriously. Yeah. 
very end of the next one to mark the end of it. Have you all had a chance to look over it? Um, are you still, do you want some more time to think about it? Yeah. Okay, many, okay. How about we detail like 741? Five minutes. Yay.
it is 741. Um, if you want more time, because all I was going to do was introduce the, um, or, well, sort of give the way to solve the problem, I guess. All right. But there's also like um, code templates on here on the slides if you want to use them. Um, if you're getting stuck somewhere or yeah, if you're, if you, so if you want more time and you like also like to look at these templates and try to solve it with them, uh, feel free to do that. So anyone hands up if you want more time? Okay, cool. And I'll just go over kind of the solution we're going to use. So first of all, you know um, what a weak vertex is. I split this in here. Okay, awesome, just to check. So a weak vertex is just um, one that has no adjacent vertices that are also adjacent to each other. Okay, cool. And so um, if we know that a triangle uh, exists at vertex i, um, if vertices j and k exist such that i is connected to j, um, j is connected to k and k is connected to i, right? Um, so we know that that is the existence criteria. So all we have to do is check if for every i that ever happens, which is pretty, um, well, I mean, it's a pretty bad algorithm, but the bounds are so small that we can, like the bounds are one, and it's between one and 20, inclusive, right? So we can run this um, algorithm without surpassing the time limit. Um, so you wanna do that. Ideally, the purpose of this problem is to help you or is to give you the first, your first chance at implementing um, a graph. So yeah, I guess I'll ask you again for, um, do you want a few more minutes to try and implement this or would you like to just move on? So I guess hands up if you would like a few more minutes to try and implement this. Okay, cool. And hands up, anyone, hands up for anyone who wants to move on. Okay, cool. I guess we will move on. Feel free to implement it later. Um, thank you. Okay, cool. Oh, we have a break. So, yes. Um, I don't know, actually. What did you say, sir? Is, is, this, is the best solution of thank you? Yeah, that's a really, that's a good question. I didn't. I know I thought because I did make the bounds small enough that that would pass, which makes me think that's a, a solution that was intended. But that's the but. Yeah, I don't know. Either. I mean, there isn't really a metric for the best solution. There might be a much more complicated way to do it in a faster time efficiency, but that might sacrifice some space efficiency. Also, you have to take into account that it takes time to think of that solution. So if you think of an O of N cube simple solution that, that uh, is fast enough for the given bound, that you could count that as the best solution. Yeah. That's a really great question. I guess, obviously, because we could almost not answer it, but that's great. Um, so yeah, I guess we have a break. I'm probably gonna make it for like two minutes because we already kind of took some time. Um, and I guess it's getting late, which is kind of a problem. So uh, three minutes, how about 7.48, you can come back. Let's take a few minutes to create. And if you want to implement this problem. I thought so. I just wasn't sure. Yes, yes. I can't believe it. I actually can't. I was shocked. What did you say, sir? Oh my gosh. Wow. Thanks for coming. Really? Creepy. Well, we'll see if that continues to be the case. I appreciate that.
Cool, yay, it's 7.48. Um, I guess we'll come back. You ready? Fantastic. So we now have, uh, now we're gonna be looking at graph traversal algorithms. Like when you have a graph um, and you want to like figure out what vertices you have, chances, like chances are you're not just gonna have like the picture, you have to actually like, how can you be sure that when you visit a, vert a vertex, um, you haven't visited before, all this sort of stuff. Well, there are some algorithms to do this called breadth first search and depth first search. And so we're going to start with breadth first search or BFS. Um, so in breadth first search, um, we start at some vertex and explore all the adjacent vertices and explore all of their adjacent vertices and so on. So it kind of looks like you're working your way outwards. You can see that this animation where you start these adjacent vertices and then adjacent vertices like that. Um, you can also see that here, hopefully this will start over in a second, um, but it's exploring all the possible paths in a graph using BFS. So you can kind of see it like crawling its way out there like that. Okay, cool. So um, this is random a little bit, but I want to introduce to you the idea of a queue. So I want you to imagine, if you want, that you are at an amusement park, right? And you want to go on a ride. What is in your way? A line, right? And so there are two ways that you can meaningfully interact with this line. You're gonna enter the line. And when you do that, you're gonna to have to do it from the back. Um, and then you're going to wait for a long time. And then at some point you'll be at the front and that's where you can exit the line, right? Um, and if you were in Britain or something, you would call that a queue. And that is why we call this data structure a queue, kind of. And so a queue is a data structure that you can interact with meaningfully in two main ways. You put something in it, so you place it at the back of the queue, and then you take something from it, you pop it, which would be removing it from the front of the queue. So, and like a real world example of this is, of course, the line. Um, so the important thing to know about this is that the first thing that you put in is also the first thing that you take out. So if you're the first person in line, you'll be the first person seen. And if you're the last person in line, well, you have to wait. Um, does this make sense? Cool. OK, yay. Um, so we can also see here, you put in two, nine, and three in this order. And then we go through two, nine, and three in that order. Okay, and so when you do them with the queue, um, you can see the syntax is kind of similar, like it, like in like style to like a vector. Um, so if you know what those are, they shouldn't be too different, except we have different functions, of course. Tree push, which we put putting like something in this case, putting the number one into the queue, and then front shows you what's at the front of the queue. Um, pop will remove the first element from the queue, so the element that's at the front of the queue it'll remove it. Uh, importantly, this doesn't tell you what's at the front. It'll just remove it. So you have to kind of use front and pop um, if you want to both see it and remove it. 
And finally, empty will be true if it's empty, false otherwise, which I guess is pretty self-explanatory. OK, cool. So now to like try and make this more concrete um, or like make sense and motivate how we're going to be implementing this in a moment, we're going to be trying to work through BFS by hand um, a little bit. I think this might be confusing, but we will see. OK. Um, so first, thing we're going to do is we're going to start at a vertex. Um, theoretically, it could be any vertex. Here is this vertex immediately labeled start. And so we will right here. And so we'll see start. So we know that this vertex exists, right? And now we want to know if this vertex exists, we want to see other vertex, other vertices that we can know exist. Uh, and we know its adjacent vertices must exist. So we see it's connected to five, right? So we can say, great. Five, that's something that we want to learn more about. We've not seen that before. Let's put it in our list. And so we'll put that in our list of vertices that we're going to be exploring in the future. Is that in there? The Zoom thing is blocking it. OK, great. And then um, the mark that is visited, and we'll explore the next vertex in our list. Does that make sense? Cool. Thank you. Um, Let's see if this will click. OK, yay. And so now we will go to the next thing on the list, which would be five. And then we'll say, so we know. Uh, so what? now that we know that five exists, what else exists in our graph? Um, we can see two, nine, and 10. So you want to put all of those in our log and say, great, let's see. Let's learn more about this. So you're going to put them in our list. Um, and great. And so we put two in first. So for two will also be the first thing that we check. Um, and we'll say, cool. Um, now that we see two, again, what can we be sure exists? Three and six. And so we will put those into our list for to visit. And you can see that we're just kind of traveling down, right? It looks kind of random on the graph, but on the um, our list of things to visit, it makes total sense. We're just going in order of where we put of what we put in, right? First in, first out. Um, and so yeah, I wish my computer was faster. Okay, cool. So nine um, has no adjacent vertices, so we can move on to 10, which has 14. We put that in our list. And then we move on to um, check what's adjacent to three, please. Okay, um, which would be four and seven. And theoretically, we would continue to do this until we explored the entire graph. Right? And so we can see when we're doing VFS that there are two general things that we need to keep track of. We need to keep track of um, the vertices that we visited, which that's easy enough because the vertices, at least in this example, were numbered. So we can just kind of say, like, um, we can just keep an array of visited vertices and mark it true if we visited it and false if we, and leave it as false if we didn't. And we also need to keep track of what vertices we need to visit next because we have this like thing on the right here, vertices to visit that was kind of integral to visiting all of the vertices. Um, what could that be? Again, it's something that moves like this and we just talked about it. It's of course a queue. So we can use a queue to implement BFS. Um, yeah, this is kind of fast, but I'll show you some pseudocode and hopefully it makes sense too when you like get to implement it yourself. Uh, so first you would create this queue um, you'd mark the starting vertex as visited. You say like, you know, we know this exists. Put it into our queue, and as long as that queue is not empty, so as long as there's a list of things left that you need to visit, um, you will remove the first thing from that list, and then check all of its neighbors and put them in that list, right? Um, and that's how you do it, uh, BFS. And so um, here is some additional code, example code for that. It's like Every line's commented, so hopefully it's very clear in what's going on. And you can actually use this to implement um, BFS in your own problems. Does anyone have any questions about this? Cool, cool. Fantastic. Um, and also, it'll probably become 
more clear or at least more useful when you get to actually implement it, which we will be able to do very soon. But before we do that, um, this was just a traversal algorithm, right? So it's just going around the graph and like um, seeing what's there. But theoretically, you want to actually do stuff with the stuff that is there, right? Um, like you want to find the shortest path to S and B, as we were talking about earlier, or you want to do whatever. And here, um, in that case, in case you want to find the shortest path, we have an algorithm for that using BFS. And it's literally, basically, exactly what we did. And for the reasons that we did it, right? So it arises kind of naturally. So recall this example that we had from earlier, um, where we were able to pretty easily find the shortest path from one vertex, uh, Justin Bieber, to every other vertex in the graph. Um, so the idea was that when we're considering some vertex B, we use the fact that we know the shortest path um, to some adjacent vert vertex of it, U, right? So if you know the shortest path of some adjacent vertex, U, then you know that your shortest path to whatever vertex you're trying to um, have a path to must be U plus one, because there's no shorter path than that, and that is the path that you have, right? Um, so to implement this, also I should ask, does that make sense? It's what we did earlier. Um, but if you have questions about it, please feel free to ask them. Also, we'll move on, but please uh, don't forget to interrupt me if you have questions. All right, so um, implementing this algorithm requires, it's like basically you just put this line of code right in there where the distance uh, u is equal to the distance v plus one. If you're currently at vertex v and you're seeing adjacent vertex u. If you're currently at vertex, yeah, sorry. If, this is, if u is the adjacent vertex and v is the one that you're already at. All righty. Um, so that is basically all you have to do to find the shortest path. And we'll also see examples of that later. But if you, when you implement BFS and you're comfortable with that, putting this in will be very simple. OK, and the final BFS algorithm that we'll be looking at today, um, which you can also do with DFS, but we haven't learned that yet, so uh, will be connectedness, right? So not to jinx anything, but what if, um, you know, COVID came back and then we all had to fly home uh, because our classes were gonna, and our classes were going to be online or whatever, right? So you, you check the flight schedule. Um, I mean, COVID's here, but, you know, uh, we, uh, you construct a graph where the vertices represent cities and the edges represent the flights between them. And it looks like this. Are you getting home? No, you're not. Um, because how are you going to make it home, right? Obviously, you cannot. There's no flights between, there is no path at all between you and your home city. And that's very unfortunate. Um, and this encapsulates the idea of connectedness in a graph, which is basically, um, so a connected component, right, is this a subset of the graph where vertices and edges exist such that um, a path exists from every vertex to every other vertex. And so if it's true that a path exists from a vertex to every other vertex um, for the whole graph, then that graph is considered connected. But if that's not true, then you have se several different uh, connected components, right? And so you can see this graph on the left here has two connected components. And this one on the right is totally connected. All right. And so, I mean, connectedness is fun because, like, how do you think like, you would figure out whether or not a graph is connected? Like, yeah, I don't know. The thing is, the way that you'd probably do it is very close to the way that, like, it's just very intuitive. You just use BFS or you try and traverse the graph and if you can't anymore and there are still vertices around then you know it must uh, be disconnected right so the idea basically in code this would be if your queue is empty but you still have vertices that are unvisited and this must mean that those vertices are not adjacent to any of the ones that you've already visited because if they were adjacent through the algorithm you would have put them in your list and you would have visited so they must be part of a separate connected component and further, slightly further, small extension of this, if you need to know for a problem like um, which 
vertices are part of which kinetic component, then you can change because you already have this Boolean vector which will keep track of whether or not you visited something. Uh, and that's important. But instead, you can replace that with a component ID vector, which will just say um, if you visited it. So you could be like negative one if you haven't, everything could be negative one if you haven't visited it, and then you could give it an ID as soon as you visit it. One, two, three, just incrementing the component ID um, when you switch components. Um, you're not going to, I don't think you're going to need to do that anytime soon here, but um, this is just something that's helpful, helpful to know, and it's a quick extension of connectedness. So cool. So it's basically how would you figure out if a graph is connected or not? And so on that note, we have another example problem. Uh, example problem B, you can go to um, this link right here. It's also, I mean, if you're in the contest already, then you'll be able to see it. It's question B. Um, where is my internet? And I will give you. I guess, how much time do you want? Maybe like six minutes to like read it and try to implement it.
Um, it's currently 8.10. Do you want more time to work on this problem? I guess the important part is the implementation of it. So if you're having a, if you feel like you want more time to try and implement it, I, like we can do another five minutes. Does that okay? Cool. Thank you.
Okay, yay. It's A15. So I guess we'll go over the solution. The thing is, this problem, just following, I mean, the section that we did, I guess it's probably pretty clear that it's like a connectedness problem. And so all you really need to do is, as he said, construct the graph BFS um, from first known keeping track, keeping track of the nodes that you visited, and then just output the nodes that are not visited. And so here is some example code that does that, right? Um, and as you can see, I guess, you know, these graph problems have a lot of implementation details. And um, though since the point of these problems, or the difficult part, I guess, of these problems is the implementation part. If you would like to not look at this and try and implement it um, after this workshop is over, that would probably be helpful to you as well, maybe, if you haven't implemented graph problems before. Yes, OK, I think that's my screen. And I was going to do a break here, but I think I'm almost done. Um, cool, yay. So finally, we have our final, um, our the second graph traversal uh, algorithm, which is DFS. DFS is really cool. Um, in depth research, we start at some vertex and we go as far as possible along some path. And then once we hit some end that we can't explore anymore, we will just jump right back to um, the earliest vertex with unexplored neighbors. Right, and hopefully you can see that here. You're jumping five and six, you can see that the traversal pattern is different uh, than with uh, BFS. And you can also see that in this sort of maze situation, um, another grid where it's going all the way. Oop. Yeah. And so, again, I'm going to interject somewhat randomly um, to tell you about a stack, right? And so, I guess. Maybe you guys are all on the hill, which is so nice. Um, if you go to like a dining hall, you might see like a stack of tray tables, um, trays that you can use. Um, theoretically, I guess people at UCLA don't usually use them, but regardless, there are stacks of trays. And there's like two, and you meaningfully interact with this stack by putting stuff on top of it or taking stuff off of it. But either way, you're only interacting with the top. You don't get to pick, you don't usually would pick trays from the middle or the bottom. This doesn't really make sense with a stack um, in the real world and a data structured stack. Um, you have two main interactions with it. You can either push, which would be place something on top of the stack, or you can pop it, which would be removing it from the top of the stack. Um, so importantly, the last thing that you put on the stack is the first thing that you take off, right? Because it's the top now does that make sense yay, yay. okay um and so some syntax for the stack similar to the queue uh you can push something like that you can check what's on the top um using this top function and you can pop something from the top using the pop function and again uh the pop function doesn't tell you it's at the top unfortunately. Also, empty will tell you if it's empty or not. OK, great. And so in this example, so with a stack, let's say you put in 2 and 9, right? And then you look at 9. And then after that, you put in a 3 right on top of it, um, in this case, on the bottom. Then you will check 3 first as opposed to 2. Um, so we can see how there's a different sort of order um, of things that you'll look at than with EQ. And we'll look at that a little bit more in depth when we do depth first search by hand again. And we'll see how this list works differently than it does um, in BFS. All right. So we'll start again with our start vertex. And we'll say, um, what's adjacent to it? What do we know exists? We know five does. So we want to put it in our list. All righty. So it's five there. Yes, it is. Okay, great. And then we will say, great, we've looked at five. Um, now we want to find what are its adjacent vertices. 
you see, 2, 9, and 10. Thus far, it's still pretty similar to VFS. But now what we're going to do is that since we looked at 10 most recently, we're going to go to and look at 10 again. And we're going to say, what are 10's most adjacent, are 10's adjacent vertices? There we go. Um, that would be 14. And so we're going to put 14 in. Now we know 14 exists. Um, but we're not going to look at, we're going to be looking at 14 first, because it's the most recent thing that we put in here. Right? And so we're going to look at 14 adjacent vertices, which would be 13 and 15. And we're going to put them in our list. And we can also see how this has sort of like a pretty clear like path, like it is making like a path through the graph as opposed to with BFS where it looks kind of like it's jumping all around. Um, but our like list on the side kind of looks like it's jumping all around, I guess. Yeah, these are differences that you can observe in the algorithms and there'll be many other differences you can see um, in the way that we can use them. And so we click through 11. This would be going faster if my computer weren't so slow. So my apologies for that. Okay, great. And so the theoretically, we go through the rest of the graph. You can see also here, um, there's a different traversal order than we got with BFS. And again, we have, um, we need a data structure that looks like this. And so we have the two things we need to keep track of when we're traversing a graph. Um, but in this case, uh, what gives us the correct order of things we need to be, uh, the correct order of what we need to be visiting would be a stack. Just fantastic. And so this can be implemented similarly to um, BFS, probably. And you can take like the pseudocode from that and replace it with a stack. But um, there is a cleaner way to uh, implement this that I want to show you just because it's so much easier to uh, use, so much nicer to use. But have you guys heard of like recursion? Have you used it yet? Oh, yes. Oh, great. Um, so if you know what that is, um, I'll still introduce it just for um, in case anyone hasn't. But uh, so the Fibonacci sequence is an example. Uh, so this is a sequence that where the next number is defined by adding the two numbers before it. So we'll have like 0 and 0 um, and 1. So 0 and 1 is 1. And 1 plus 1 is 2. And 2 plus, uh, 1 plus 2 is 3. 2 plus 3 is 5, et cetera, et cetera, forever. Um, so more generally, we have the fib of n would be the Fibonacci of n minus 1 plus the Fibonacci number of n minus 2, right? For n, the, um, the index, they were looking for the n Fibonacci number. OK, and so we can see like this um, equation. So this def mathematical definition of the sequence is a natural example of recursion, which is where a function calls itself. So we can see that what this would look like in this like block of code right here. Um, and so we can see how at the bottom it's calling itself. Um, if you know how this works, this is great. But yeah, basically it needs to, you can use this every time you need to, uh, a solution to a problem depends on smaller instances of the problem. And in DFS, that is the case, as you can see right here. I guess we are actually gonna have a workshop where we talk about this more in depth. And if you know what it is already, then that is great. But this, the idea of recursion will motivate this example code, which you can see is so much shorter than VFS. Even this code was so long, kind of. But this is so much shorter. And so we have just this um, function. And you can, you say, you call it, you say, this, you visit this vertex. And then you um, will check all of its neighbors and put it in there, and then call the function on that. And so, so much simpler. And I would, if you'd like to use that, and if you don't really know what recursion is yet, then you can also sort of use this as a black box, but hopefully this is in somewhat motivated for you. Okay, and so just put cheat sheet on like some traversal order with breadth first search and depth first search. And with that, we do have this final problem. Um, but I think it's kind of a complicated problem um and it's getting late i want to give you time to do the contest this is also not on the contest because it's like limited licensing i don't know what that means but that is what let me put it on the contest so um yeah if you want to try this problem we have solution slides for it 
and we can talk about it. So come talk to me about it. Um, or you can also look at the slides for the solutions yourself if it's after, I guess, now or, you know, DM me on Discord, whatever, any of us. But uh, I would say, this is not great. Let's just start the um, contest now. 8.30. Yeah, unless you guys want to go over this problem, would you like to try it? Yeah, OK. Work on the contest, like. Thank you for watching, uh, for participating in this presentation. You guys are doing great. Um, hopefully you learned um, a lot of new interesting things about graphs and you enjoy them. And try the contest problems. I think I worked hard to try and get good ones that will actually test the knowledge that you have. So try them out, especially the first few. Yay. Thank you so much.